What is up, everybody? I am so excited for this one. Having Mr. Alan Roger Curry on to talk about Mode 1 and his direct approach to the game. Now, I've known about ARC for a very long time. He's one of those OGs in the space. Uh, even to this day, I, I believe Mode 1 first came out in, uh, in 2006. And even to this day, dating coaches constantly talk about it, always refer to it, and the test of time. What is up, my man? How are you? I'm doing just great. Thank you for having me. Hey, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, Mode 1, I, I was saying it before, Mode 1 is, it, it's, it's almost like the Bible when it comes to uh, pickup and dating. And I'm just, I'm extremely honored to have you on to talk about it. Well, thank you for those flattering comments. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, so I, I know there's going to be a lot of people that may not know who ARC is. So could you give kind of like an introduction on yourself, uh, an introduction of like what Mode 1 is? I know we both understand it's like a direct style of game, but for anybody who may not be aware kind of what that is. Yeah, I first uh, started being what I now refer to as Mo One with Women all the way back when I was in college, because I'm now uh, 58 years old. <laughs> so I'm definitely an OG. Uh, but I started exhibiting Mo One behavior back when I was a college student at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. And um, yeah, I ended up, because of some experiences with women, I ended up dividing, documenting, which later became an ebook and then later became a paperback. I concluded that all verbal communication styles with women basically fell into what I asserted was four categories or four modes, which was mode one, mode two, mode three, and mode four. Um, I would say Mo one and Mo four represent what's commonly known as a direct style of verbal communication. And Mo two and Mo three represent what's commonly known in the manosphere as an indirect style of communication. And I'll give the gist of each Mo. Uh, Mo two would be you meet a woman, initiate a conversation with her, and then you proceed to engage in a conversational style that is fairly polite, very cautious, flattering to a degree, entertaining to a degree, and probably most prominently vague and ambiguous, kind of beat around the bush. Um, as I said in my most recent book called No Free Attention, for the most part, Mo 2 is dishonest in this sense. You're you're not there, there's two ways you can lie to people. You can lie by commission or you can lie by omission. Mo 2 is guilty of lying by omission. Cause typically if you're talking to a woman and your objective say is short term casual sex, you're not upfront about that. You you keep that to yourself. Um then Mo 3 is representative of lying by commission. In worst case scenario, when you're Mo 3, you're too timid to approach women at all. So one one variation of Mo 3 would be what I call Mo 3 timid. You don't, you don't have the confidence or courage to approach a woman and initiate a conversation with her at all. And for those guys who do have enough confidence and courage to initiate a conversation, everything about their conversation is typically dishonest, disingenuous, misleading, manipulative, and cowardly. Mo four is when you're like a bitter type dude. You, you've had some bad experiences with women in the past. You might have got rejected by quite a few women, ignored by quite a few women, exploited and manipulated by quite a few women, generally treated disrespectfully by quite a few women. And so now you've accumulated a high degree of bitterness and resentment towards women. So uh, that would end up coming across as very antagonistic and borderline misogynistic with women. That would be mode four. And then finally, mode one 
It's just when everything about your conversation is a combination of, of confident, authentic, and upfront and straightforwardly honest. You, you're not trying to BS a woman. You're not trying to engage in any type of manipulative head games. And you, you know, basically, you, as the subtitle of my book says, you let women know what you're really thinking, what you really want from them. Why are you really talking to this woman? Why do you really want to share her company? And uh, my first ebook version of that book, Mo One, came out in right before Memorial Day in 1999. And then my first paperback version came out in February of 2006. And since then, I've self published what, at least three or four additional books. I have four audio books. And uh, my nickname in the manosphere is The Godfather of direct verbal game knowledge, wisdom, and advice. Yes, sir. And that direct game, it is it is so important. I, I'm thinking, you know, you're first talking about Indiana University and I'm thinking back to college. And I never had like a name to how I approached women or how I dealt with them. Mm -hmm. um, but I did notice that a lot of guys, even within my own fraternity, they would become friends with these girls and they were attracted to them, but they would never make a move. And they would wait for that prime opportunity to do something. And then she would freak out about it. And it would completely ruin that friendship that they had because she had no idea that he was even attracted to her. Yeah. Yeah, that happens a lot with guys. I caught, as a matter of fact, I have a term for that. Speaking of fraternities, my fraternity, which is Cap Alpha Psi, what you just described, we generally would call that fun clubbing. I have that included in a couple of my books. Fun clubbing. Fun clubbing is anytime you start a series of interactions with a woman pretending like you're content with being their purely platonic male friend, but in actuality, you either want that woman to be your next long-term girlfriend or at minimum, you want her to be your next casual sex lover. Yeah, that's fun clubbing. Gotcha. I, I want to give a shout out to uh, it's the Grand Cam here. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, the donation, man. Appreciate the support. Um, yeah, so it's 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 absolutely crazy because I don't understand why guys have such an issue with it. It, it was the same thing. I, I remember I listened. You were on with uh, another Alex playing with fire, and you were mm -hmm. telling your origin story and how you were just like, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. I'm going to go ahead and just tell the girl like exactly what I'm thinking. I like, cause if you're out and you're looking to, to hook up or move something forward, like what's the point of lying about it? And it just, it was like a spark for you. It just happened. And you're like, Oh my God, it's like a cheat code. Cause I had always practiced the same style and it does, it pushes some people away. Um, but you're cutting through the BS and you're not being dishonest. Exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, the simple point is that for the life of me, well, I, I'm not going to act like I don't understand. For the most part, I do understand why I have the haters I do, the harsh critics I do. But at the same time, it's like, if you're not a fan of my Mo One approach, you know, which is representative, again, of direct verbal game, and let's say you're more a fan of indirect verbal game, then why don't you just concentrate on that working for you? Why do so? I, it, it's like I have so many guys that go out of their way to try to prove that my more one approach is, is in effect. were some of my closest friends in the fraternity, my, my fraternity brothers. They used to say, oh, Alan, you'll never get away with just telling a woman straight up that you want to bang her and, you know, you don't want to be her boyfriend. Because to kind of somewhat throw a lot of my frat brothers under the bus, most of my frat brothers, when they wanted casual sex, what they would do is what a lot of guys do to this day. They would pretend like they wanted to be that woman's next long-term boyfriend. They would give her the misleading impression that, they, you know, they wanted to be her boyfriend. And then after they had sex with her two times, three times, five times, ten times, 
they would just go ghost on us. And I was pretty much the first guy in my fraternity to go against that, that routine. I was like, no, if I want casual sex, I'm going to tell a woman straight up that that's all I want. And again, a lot of them were like, no, nah, that'll never work. You're going to get slapped. You're going to have get drinks thrown in your face. And then once they saw me working my magic, they were like, whoa, dang, Alan got some kind of Jedi mind trick. How is he doing that? He just tells women straight up. And, and uh, But anyway, yeah, I've had so many guys over the, the past few decades that's just like, oh, I'm on one, I'll never work. You, know, you know, can never be successful with women doing that. Yeah, no, and it it is so true, and it's um, they, women appreciate that, you know. Like, imagine how they feel if you act like you want to be a boyfriend. You go ahead and and you hook up that night, and then you never speak to her again. <laughs> exactly, and that's the thing. I, I I talk about this all the time on my channel. I, I was just talking about my quote-unquote haters and critics, I very rarely have female haters and critics of my mom one approach. I would say no less than 95% of the women I've talked to over the years about my mom one approach, they love it. They love it and they respect it. I, I rarely have women say, oh, no, I would never want a man to be mom one with me, never. Oh, that, that would disgust me. I, 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 I've never had a woman say that. But yeah, I got all these guys that are, that that try to hate on it. But yeah, women. Uh, the last time I would say was uh, I was in uh, Los Angeles where I used to live for six and a half years, and I was attending this conference, and I ended up having kind of some you could say informal survey type conversations with some women about a few issues related to my books, like. Mo one versus Mo two and alpha male versus beta male type stuff, direct versus indirect. And when I get into a long story, I, I, I talked to about roughly 15 women. All of them said, this was pretty much every woman said, it. they said when it came to casual sex, they said they wanted all men to be Mo one. The only time they gave me some difference of opinion was when it came to a long-term relationship. That's what I did have some women say, well, I don't know, for a long-term relationship, I might want a guy to be more slow-paced, indirect. Um, but for casual sex, all of them were like, no, I, I would rather guy be more one. Absolutely. And I have to say, personally, um, women that I've done more of that direct mode one approach to, mm -hmm. those are the women that I have the greatest sexual chemistry with. Because it's just, it's innate. And it's just, it, it just, it turns them on. And when it clicks, it clicks. I, I thousand percent agree with you, Alex, man. It, that's been my experience too. And I would say that's been the experience of just about all, you know, my clients who've been able to use Mo one to their benefit have said the same thing. They said it just creates a higher degree of sexual chemistry between them and the women. Absolutely. So, um, for anybody who doesn't exactly understand it, like obviously I want you to plug your book and I want everybody to check it out. Um, I will include some of that in the description afterwards. But what does a mode one approach look like? Let's, let's say, for example, you were out, you see a girl and you're going to use the mode one approach to go talk to her. What does that exactly look like? Okay, good question. I have actually, most of my followers know, I have three distinct versions of Mo One that range in terms of language and range in terms of just how quickly you lay your sexual desires, interests, and intentions on the table. I'll start with the most explicit to the least. My most explicit version of Mo One is what I call Mo One Hardcore. Mo One Hardcore. That's that's a real ballsy that would be an example that obviously would be like you say you had a party and there's a sexy woman there and you literally just go up to her and you're like, you are just fucking sexy. And I would love to have you come back to my place so I can just fuck you silly so we can exchange orgasms and have a great time. I mean, just like right off the rip. And 
I realize that a lot of guys, if they're inexperienced, don't have quite the balls to pull that off. And that's where a lot, and if they lot try of it, and if they try it, they come across extremely uncalibrated, and that's when it gets creepy. Yeah, I mean, if you, that's where my coaching comes in. Because see, if guys, as you just alluded to, you gotta have a certain demeanor to pull off more one hardcore. You gotta have a certain level of confidence, certain demeanor and disposition. Because, like I said, if you, like, say you got a real awkward, nervous, non-confident type demeanor, hey, I would like to fuck you, silly, at my place, uh, are you down or not down? I mean, like you said, see, right there, creepy, creepy. Woman's like 911 on her phone. So a lot of guys think it's about the words. It's not so much about the words. Well, that was important, too, but... You got to have everything to be congruent with those words. So again, yeah, you can't be this awkward type communicator and try to pull up more one hardcore. But anyway, that's more one hardcore. Again, is when you just within the first say 30, 60, 90 seconds of the conversation, you're letting the woman basically know that you want to engage in intercourse with her. Stand what I call standard more one is when you would take roughly about three to five minutes to fill a woman out. So you would, uh, it, here's my typical default mode, standard mode one approach. I usually would just go up to a woman and say, so when would, when would you like to share my company one-on-one? -on -one, next week or the week after? That's, man, it would range from woman to woman, but that would be probably the closest thing I had to a, a default opener. I would say so. When would you like to share my company, one-on-one, -on -one, next week or the week after? And what that would allow me to do, that question, if anybody's read my books and is familiar with my books, they know I have five, all of my principles, you could say, sit around five uh, archetypes of women, which is the reciprocator, the rejector, the wholesome pretender, the erotic hypocrite, and the manipulative time waster. And I'll go ahead and get the gist of each of those. The two most straightforward women you're going to talk to, any man's going to talk to, is a reciprocator and rejector. A reciprocator is a woman that knows within a minute or two after she meets you that she's attracted to you, finds you sexually appealing, and basically she's down the fuck. And she's going to let you know that. She's not going to hesitate. She's not going to try to play any games, you know, beat around the bush. She's going to let you know that. As soon as you... Basically, as soon as you express an interest in having sex with her, she's going to reciprocate. It. Similarly, but at the same time, totally differently would be the rejector. A rejector is a woman that knows within the first 30, 60, 90 seconds after you approach her that you're just not her type for whatever reason. You might be too short. You might not be the race or ethnicity she likes. She, whatever. Your teeth might not be as white as she wants to be. It can be a number of things, but she knows fairly quickly you're not her type, or it might be just on her, not necessarily you're not her type, but she might be already married, or she might be already in love with a boyfriend or something like that. So anyway, she's going to reject you fairly quickly. She's not going to beat around the bush or anything. Now, the three trickier types is the wholesome pretender, erotic hypocrite, and manipulative time waster. A wholesome pretender is a woman that, for the most part, is attracted to you. And deep down, she doesn't mind engaging in a few episodes of short-term casual sex. But she has some concern over being slut-shamed. Because she, she's, she's really paranoid about her good girl reputation and, and, and public image. So what she's going to try to find out from a guy, first and foremost, is are you a guy who's just private, confidential, and discreet? She, she'll usually make comments to the effect of, well, I'm a good girl, you know, and I don't, I don't want to ever have a reputation for just jumping in bed with guys. And what she's really trying to find out is, if I do go ahead and jump in bed with you, you're not going to, like, tell all your frat brothers tomorrow, are you? You know, are you, are you going to be able to keep our interaction between you and I? And you just essentially would have to reassure her in one way or another that you are a private, confidential, discreet type guy. 
Now, one of them's going to give you a little bit more hard time, and that's an uh, understatement almost. The Rodney Hypocrite, Rodney Hypocrite is a more materialistic, pretentious, and antagonistic and argumentative version of a wholesome pretender. That's the type of woman that say you would approach her and be more one and propose casual say she's going to be like, what? Do I look like a slut to you? Do I? Do I just look like a two-bit whore to you? Is that what I look like? You better, you better talk about taking me out to dinner somewhere, you know, and spending some time with me, getting to know me, you jerk, you asshole. You know, she's going to try to throw out criticisms and insults. Because one of the things she's trying to do is, and I'm sure you're familiar, certain women, they don't, they don't shit test guys to see yep. where you stand. To put it in overly simplistic terms, a lot of women shit test guys to basically see if they're truly alpha or if they're pretending to be alpha. To, <laughs> to see if they can keep their frame. They're trying mm -hmm. to test to see, is this guy really the guy he's presenting himself as or exactly. not? Exactly. Exactly. And they feel like if they give you a bunch of harsh criticisms and insults, if you're being disingenuous, if you're pretending to be, say, more confident and more alpha than you really are, at some point you're going to crumble. You're going to start getting real defensive and even maybe apologetic and, you know, argumentative, like, hey, I'm not a jerk. Why you call me a jerk, I'm man? And see, once a woman sees you crumble like that, she's going to lose respect for you. Uh, because she, she knows you're not authentic. And then the final of the five categories is uh, the manipulative time wasting. And see, this is the architect that's most relevant to the whole direct versus indirect argument. Because a lot of guys, when they're indirect, they'll assume that if they meet a woman, let's say Tiffany, and she seems very friendly, and even more so than friendly, she seems very flirtatious, They'll feel like, okay, yeah, I'm on my way. I'm on my way to connecting with Tiffany. But what they don't know is, what some guys don't know is that in the same way a lot of men sometimes get labeled by women as being sexual predators, there's a lot of women out here who are time-oriented and money-oriented predators. They look yes. for guys to exploit them for one of these two things, if not both, either for their financial resources and material possessions and or just simply for their non-sexual time, attention, and companionship. And see, that's what I always say is the, the, the biggest weakness, at least in my strong opinion, of indirect verbal game is that in worst case scenario, when you're indirect, you won't be able to identify a manipulative time waster at all, at least until it's too late. Or it, you know, it slows down your ability to identify the manipulative time waster. Whereas when you're more one, you, I can identify a manipulative time waster usually within the first five to 10 minutes of my very first conversation. So now that takes me all the way back to my three versions. We got past Mo one hardcore. Standing Mo one, when I do that default opener, so when would you like to share my company? One on one, next week or the week after. I can tell based on women's responses. If they're a reciprocator, rejector, wholesome tender, erotic hypocrite, or manipulative time Yep. And then the final of the three variations of Mo 1, the most conservative and tame is what I call Mo 1.5. That was actually first coined by my older brother named Steven. And with Mo 1.5, there's mainly two components to it. Number one, you don't use any profanity, any sexually explicit language at all. So for guys who kind of have an aversion to using profanity or R-rated, X-rated, triple X-rated language, you wouldn't use any of that when you mow 1.5. And secondly, you would more so put emphasis on letting the woman know what you don't want than what you do want. So an example of that would be, let's say I'm talking to a woman named Amber for at least five minutes, somewhere between five to 10 minutes. And at some point between the five and 10 minute mark, I say, Amber, I'm just going to be straight with you. I don't do platonic friendships. Don't do it. So if you're looking for your next male platonic friend, I'm not the guy. You get that? And secondly, at this point in my life, I just really want to play the field. So I'm not 
I don't want to be your next long-term boyfriend. I'm not interested in any relationship too serious, too emotionally profound, too strictly monogamous. Not interested in that. So I just wanted to give you, you know, heads up, full disclosure, let you know where I stand. And then you see what her response is. You let the conversation basically flow from there. And what happens most of the time when you say you're more 1.5 is <laughs> women aren't stupid. They'll say, oh, so in other words, you just want to fuck me, is what you're saying. <laughs> You know, I've had that, women say that like, when I was more than 1.5. They'll say, oh, see, in other words, you just want to fuck me for a few weeks and then go your separate ways. Mm -hmm. um, so they Interesting. Have. Yeah, and, and I think what's most important when you approach it that way, you got to stand your ground. If you say something like that, and then she's like, oh, yeah, you just want to fuck me. And then you immediately like, oh, no, 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 no. It, it, it's again, it's like one of those shit tests trying to shake that frame. So that let me fun? ask you, okay. let me, let me ask you with all of these, I know a, I've been, you know, I do dating coaching myself. I've been in a lot of these dating communities. I've seen guys try and practice mode one when they're not ready for it. And it just falls flat and they don't understand. Now, how does somebody develop the proper frame to use techniques like this? Oh, it, 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 I can go give you a real lengthy answer, which I don't want to, but in simple terms, and again, this is where I plug my culture, this is where my culture comes in. What I do with, with clients typically, fairly speaking, I go in their head and identify all the flaws and weaknesses in their social programming and uh, cultural conditioning. Because all of us, both men and women, other than our raw biological impulses, which is what motivates certain aspects of our behavior, the other most significant aspect, of course, uh, motivating factor behind our behavior is our social programming and our cultural conditioning. For example, that, that would represent like the beliefs you have, you maintain valid or invalid, the positive or negative attitudes you maintain towards the whole concept of dating relationships and towards women, some of your, your fears, some of your egotistical insecurities and memories of your past experiences with women. So given those five categories, when I start coaching a guy, I'll start asking, like, if you read my original Mo One book, one compliment I got um, from this guy named George Bruno. He said, Alan, what I love about your, your book, Mall One, is how you have all these self-examination questions at the end of the chapters. And that that's part of the process of guys. I did, I, the simple th a simple example of this would be, on the social program, would be a guy who firmly believes that you shouldn't talk about sex with a woman in the first conversation. Like, my mother told me that, honestly, when I was young. My mother told me to never bring up the subject of sex in, in the very first conversation. She said it would make me look like, you know, a low-class jerk and all this stuff. And for at least a few years, I maintained that belief until I had, if anybody owns my book, who said again, probably my most significant turning point where my, a lot of my paradigm shift was verbal seduction story number one in my book, who said again. And that's what I realized in, in simple terms that women are not these innocent, wholesome creatures that most men think they are. <laughs> they want to fight just as much as we do. And uh, the one thing that's a little different is the fact that most women from the time they're preteens, speaking of social programming, they're usually socialized by their mothers and fathers, if their father's active in their life, that if you want to find a husband, if you want to get married, you have to present yourself as the good girl, the respectable good girl. You, you, that's what you got to do to find a husband. And so a lot of women go out in the world and say, yeah, I got to present myself as a good girl. But here's one problem. I was just talking about one of the other things that motivates our behavior is our biological desires and impulses. They don't always agree for women. So, so what I like to use the metaphor with women is Here's what you got with a lot of women. You got the little angel on the right shoulder that says, Lisa, be a good girl. Present yourself as a good girl. Then you got the little devil on the left shoulder that says, 
girl. He's he's handsome. He's sexy. Go ahead and give him some." And they'll be like, they'll be like arguing in her mind, like, "No, be the good girl. Give him some. Be the good girl. Give him some." And that's where your seduction comes into play. But but going back to dealing with men and coaching men, yeah, you got to go inside their heads because so many guys get all these like beliefs. Some of them might be valid, but most of them are invalid. Some of them have negative and misogynistic attitudes towards women. Some still holding on to like a bad experience with a girl from high school or college. And I just kind of figure she can go in their head and say, okay, throw that out, delete that, get that out of here. So that they can be free to be more one. Because no guy can really effectively exhibit more one behavior. If he has, if his head is full of flawed social programming. Absolutely. No, I, I completely agree with that. That's, it's one thing that I work on with everybody. It's like the first thing. It's that self-work. Have you done the self-work yet? Or are you just trying to jump forward? Are you just trying to get a girlfriend? Are you just trying to get laid? Like, what are we really trying to do here? And I have to say, like, I think it's more now than ever that we have that, you know, misogynistic views, those you know, insult minded type of guys. And they're just like angry at the world and they're ang angry at girls. And it's like, why? There's no reason to be. It's just the way it's the way people interact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, a lot of incels. And with the incels, I don't want to you know, disparage all of them, because I, I, I know that some of them are genuinely looking for help from guys like you and I. But there's too many guys out here that are looking for what I like to refer to as a magic pill solution. They they just want the, the quick overnight success type formula. And I let guys know up front, I, I'm not your guy if that's what you're looking for. I'm, I don't have any magic pills for you. You know, you want to put in the work. And, um, but yeah, you, you got a lot of guys. And in there, in this, some of their guys, partial defense, though, I think, you know, there's some guys in this industry, the dating advice industry, that market themselves as having an overnight success magic pill for guys. And they'll say, hey, if you buy my DVDs, buy. If today is Wednesday, by Friday morning, you'll be a great womanizer. You'll be slaying women left and right. And it's like, come on, man. Yeah. And it's just, it's ridiculous. And it's it's almost, it's preying on people's false hope. And mm -hmm. that's what I really respect about you, Alan, is that you you have the integrity. And if somebody is approaching you for coaching and they do not fit, and they, they're just looking for that like magic fix, I, I'm assuming you're like me, and you will turn them away if they do not fit, fix or fit to that uh, exact mindset that you need to actually improve in this area. Exactly. Uh, that you, you, you hit it right on the head. That's exactly what I do. Because I've had guys who have come to me in one way or another looking for an, an overnight success magic pill. And I tell them, I say, you know, I've even, you know, uh, like – People bought, say, a Skype or telephone consultation from me. I'll immediately refund their money. Once I know that they're in that category, I'm like, no, I'm not your guy. If you're looking for that type, you know, you want to be two days from now, you want to be the world's greatest ladies man and woman. As in, no, I'm not, I'm not your guy. Um, yeah. No, and I, I think that's great. The one thing that I pride myself in is when I do initial consults with people, I am very direct and very straightforward with them. And I get on their case right away. And I'm like, I'm going to give you the God's honest truth. And this is how we're going to do things. If you can't handle that, this is not a good match. Because I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, that, that, and yeah, that, that's, that's the thing. You, you got, and that's the problem. You got too many guys. Uh, the more snake oil salesmen, scam artists type PUAs and dating coaches that are telling guys what they want to hear instead of, like you said, what, what they need to hear. And, um, and it's a shame, but, you know. 
Yeah, so it is. It, it's not up to us to fix everybody. We can fix those who want to actually get the right information, but it's mm -hmm. it's up to you know you as the consumer and trying to improve your life. Like, are you actually looking for the truth? Or what, what is it you're looking for? Because quite frankly, I, I see a lot of these um, uh, companies, programs, coaches, well, they'll have like 40 different courses you can take. And it's, it's just to like cycle you around and like essentially like a glorified friend group of people to like bitch and moan to about the way the world is. Exactly. Yeah, and see... Here's guys, guys listening, here's one way you can tell you're dealing with a more shady type guy. Is any guy that tries to make you believe that if you follow their advice and follow their method, you'll like never ever get rejected. That that's your first red flag. Anybody tries to tell you, hey, if you follow my advice, you will never ever deal with rejection again. That's BS. I don't care who you are. You could be Brad Pitt. Somebody's going to reject you. There might be some guys who have lower percentages of rejection than others. But generally speaking, all guys, you, there's always going to be a percentage of women that are just, in one way or another, going to say, I'm not interested. And you, you got to have the egotistical strength to deal with that when that happens. But for any, but there, I've seen various guys over the last, two decades that have tried to market products that and one of their selling points is once you follow my advice, you'll never ever be rejected again. That that's that's BS. That is just crazy. I I, I mean we we see it all and I'm sure you've seen a lot more of it than me. because uh, I you know I'm younger and I haven't come into the space until more recently. But um but yeah it's just it's absolutely wild and you know it, it is. It's preying on people's false hope that they can get that, like, quick fix. It's like getting that quick pill to take this and forever and never get rejected, and you'll have five models in your bed tomorrow. Like, get exactly. out of here. And here's where they get you. Here's where they get the more naive guys. And you mentioned it. You said some of these guys have, like, say, 40 different unique courses. What they make guys feel, these guys who will say you'll never get rejected, let's say you bought course number one and you come back to the guy and say hey you know i use course number one and i, I get rejected by like five out of the six women i approach and then that guy says well that's why you need course number two it'll help you fix all your weaknesses because see you've got a lot of weaknesses so you need course number two the guy says oh okay then he course number two he still get rejected they say hey you need course number three you need three. <laughs> and they keep selling you more and more courses. Like, hey, the reason why you fell with that one woman at the party, because you didn't have course number 12. That's the one you need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it just goes on and on and on. And then once you get to the end, it's like, but wait, we got course 41 coming out. And that's going to be the, the ultimate <laughs> mastermind group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's crazy it is it's it's wild and you know quite honestly the reason why i love this it's 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 so interesting because if you're a dating coach and you help somebody get better at it once you help them once they figure it out they are not a repeat customer because they don't need to be anymore but that's what i love about it is because i like to see people completely change their lives and I don't want to see you again. I want to get everything fixed, and I want you to be happy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Yeah, you want them to, quote, unquote, graduate from your, your teachings and your coaching and, and just go out there and be successful. You don't want them – you don't want to have a client for, like, 15 years. That means some, something's wrong. There's some disconnect. Um, yeah, and it's it's so strange. I I've talked to uh, some coaches, and they're like, "Yeah, I got some long term clients." And I'm like, "What do you mean long term client? It doesn't like the the idea doesn't make sense to me." <laughs> yeah, I mean, but yeah. I don't know. I so I actually I got a question here, and I'm trying to understand. Uh, it's the Grand Cam had asked, 
what do you recommend for men who are interested to be in the phone sex business? Now, I'm not quite sure whether he means kind of running sort of like a webcam style thing where he has girls working for him or what? Uh, well, that, that question might be prompted by, in my book, Who Said Again, I acknowledge that I used to be for at least a six year period, I was what I like hardly call a phone sex gigolo. Like I've had literally hundreds of women pay me for phone sex. Um, specifically between roughly 2003 and 2009 was when I was doing that a lot. And um, so I've had guys from time to time, they say, hey, Alan, you know, how can I become a, a phone sex gigolo and get women to, well, number one, you got to be good at it. If he's, if this guy is talking about for himself, you just got to be exceptionally good at talking dirty to the point where you can make women come just by talking dirty to them. Um, but beyond that, if you're talking about now, if you're talking about something more like you hiring girls, that's that's out of my realm of expertise. I would I would you know, I would assume you just you know get some sexy sounding girls and uh, and start marketing. But if he's talking about for himself, yeah, just number one, be good at phone sex to the point where women want to have phone sex with you again and again and again. Set up some type of PayPal where they 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 send you money to to, to buy it. And then you go off from there because that, that, that's how I did it when I was doing the phone sex thing. Yeah, I, I just had women, they would pay me through PayPal. And, uh, Interesting. Yeah, no, so Cam is actually, uh, he's my business partner. And I think that that's what he was referring to oh, is okay. uh, that, that type of style. And, I mean, Cam's got a great voice. Cam, oh, we're going to talk about this. Let's get this business started. You can become a uh, phone sex gigolo as well. <laughs> yeah, but Kay, I'm gonna tell you something. I used to think when I was younger, and I think a lot of guys, speaking of paying for phone sex, a lot of guys think only men would be willing to pay a woman for phone sex, but not vice versa. But it's actually two women I had met on an online site who first encouraged me because what happened, I was having phone sex with some women basically for free. And then these two women that were my phone sex partners, they had told some girlfriends about me. And their girlfriends were like, oh, I, I want to have, he sounds really nasty. I want to have phone sex with him. And they, they, they said, they jokingly at first, they jokingly said, oh, well, you're going to have to, you're going to have to pay his rate. You're going to have to pay him money. Thinking they would be like, oh, get out of here. And they were like, well, what's his rate? If it's reasonable, I'll pay it. And that's when they came to me. They're like, Alan, you need to start charging because we know some women that are willing to pay you. And I was like, at first I was like, shut up, get out of here. I didn't believe it myself. I was like, get out of here. Woman wants to pay me? Long story short, after they set it up, they helped me set it up, man. Within less than a year, I had over 500 female clients. That is insane. I am. I. I don't believe you, but like, I, I mean, obviously, I do believe you, but like, I. I, I can't. I can't comprehend that. It's yeah, so many. Man, a lot of women look. I tell you, the number one woman who. There's a lot of women who are in the phone sex, but if I had to pick one specific demographic, it would be women who are in between relationships. And they're very, very, very reluctant to engage in uh, in casual physical sex because of that whole, you know, when I was talking about them, some women, they, they care too much about their reputation. So there, there's a lot of women, they're, 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 they're reluctant to do the casual sex. And they only, basically, they only want to have physical sex within the context of a relationship. But because they don't have any prospects for a relationship, they're still horny. And they got toys like a, a dildo, a vibrator, whatever. And so they're kind of compromised as phone sex. And um, yeah, man, I had phone sex with, a, yeah, again, specifically between the period of like 2003 and 2009. Oh, man. That was like, it was literally like my part-time job. That was like my part-time job was, was That's crazy. having phone sex with women. Wow. So 
When are you uh, starting your OnlyFans? <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. Have a good one. Uh, shoot, I'm good just start. about OnlyFans. But yeah, man. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a trip, man. And, but, you know, it's funny here since we're on phone sex. Well, one thing about phone sex, I've told guys... That's one of the reasons why I understand women so well. And, and what I emphasize in my books is the concept of women's sexually duplicitous nature, which in simple terms mean they, they publicly like to present themselves as the innocent, wholesome, good girl, but they're really these, these kinky freaks behind closed doors. I learned probably just as much, if not more, from my phone sex episodes about women's sexually duplicit nature than I did the women that I actually interacted with physically. Because women would share just certain fantasies they had, things they wanted to do. And if you saw a picture of the women who would tell me like the kinkiest fantasies, it just shows you can't judge a book from because it'd be the most conservative looking women, like the old classic librarian type hair pulled back in a bun. They got the conservative glasses. And I'd be the main woman like, yeah, Alan, I want three guys to just slap their cocks on my face at the same time. And I take turns sucking them all off. And you're like, damn, you freak you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, open it's up. crazy. It's because they, they feel like a sense of like safety doing it that way. And they just, they don't, I don't know what that is where, um, you know, it's tough because nowadays we're, we're pushing for women to be more like sexually open and, and whatnot. But um, I don't know, there's like a line, like you really like the, the whole lady in the streets freaking a bed that, that is just the God honest truth. And it has been forever. Yep. And it's just, I don't know. I, I think things are getting kind of, you know, women, they're being more open about it, but guys don't want a girl. I don't know. It's, it's it's a tough time right now. And I, I actually, going off of like current day, I wanted to ask you this question. So when you think mode one and you think very direct, mm -hmm. I know a lot of guys use the excuse and to a certain extent it is fair, but like the whole like me too movement, all of that type of stuff. And so they're nervous to act that way or they're nervous to speak that way. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to somebody who's thinking in uh, in that way? Uh, good question. It's been brought up to me a lot over the last, I'd say, three years. Matter of fact, I'm tempted to name another dating coach by name, but I probably won't. But I had another dating coach. He's very popular, black male dating coach. <clears throat> Let's just say his initials are similar to mine. ARC, he has a three-letter initial. And he was one of the first guys that started trying to criticize Mo One in that respect. He was saying, you guys shouldn't be Mo One because you're going to get me too. You're going to get me too. You're going to get me too. And then some, a lot of other guys start echoing his criticism. But here's the thing. Here's what I always point out. If you look at just about all the guys who've been victims or targets, I should say, of, of Me Too allegations, hardly any of them were guys that were just direct, Mo one. It's mainly guys who fall into the four categories. Most of the guys who've been targets of Me Too allegations, from most extreme to least extreme, has been guys who are rapists or date rapists. Category number two would be guys that have physically groped women without their permission and or expose their genitalia to women without their consent or permission. Category number three was guys in a work situation would offer women like a promotion or some type of employment off related offer in exchange for sex. And fourth was basically guys who were indirect, guys who tried to trick women, you know, who basically toyed with women's emotions, had the woman believing that, you know, this guy was going to marry the woman or, or be her long-term boyfriend. And then once he got the, the ass, he just went ghost. But I've honestly rarely, if ever, 
heard of a situation where say a guy met a woman just straightforwardly said, hey, I'm attracted to you. I think you're sexy. I would love to engage in a few episodes of casual sex. And the next day, he was, like, in jail or I, – I even invite guys. I say, tell me about a, a, somebody well-known, like a celebrity, politician, somebody that was just mown one, and he had some kind of dire consequences as a result. And they never can name anybody. But yet, all these people keep spreading this this – narrative that if, if you're more no i'll be honest if if if, a, if the wrong guy like we started off talking about how it takes a certain demeanor and disposition and frame to be mo one hardcore my version mo one called mo one hardcore i can see how that could lead to some problems with if if it's in the hands of the wrong guy a guy that just, just doesn't deliver or just, or delivers it with a coworker. Number one, I always say, and some guys disagree with me on this, but in most situations, you shouldn't be trying to bang your coworker, and particularly a subordinate. Yes. Anyway, Ben, when you rewatch this later, this is for you. We tell you every single week: stop doing it. <laughs> My buddy does this all the time. I'm like, stop banging people at work. You're getting yourself in trouble. <laughs> yeah, man. That's the number one, number one piece of advice to avoid any work-related consequences. Is simply don't try to bang your coworkers, whether it's your boss or supervisor, somebody on the same level as you, and for damn sure somebody that reports to you like that's a subordinate of yours. That's you. You asking it to be fired, and um, so yeah, man. I mean, it, there's there's too many women out there, man. Man, what an argument I get with that. Sometimes I say. Well, man, I work 80 hours a week, and, you know, I probably see more women at work than I do in my free time because I really don't have any free time because I'm a workaholic. I'm like, dude, develop a social life, man. Yeah. Because yeah. my attitude is, even if you don't get Me too even before the Me Too era came, I know from experience, man, when you have sex with women and that you work with, once – it ends you asking for drama to come into the workplace. Because say you, you have sex with a woman named Angela for six months and things will go well for six months. But then you tell Angela one day, you say, hey, you know, I want to see other people, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to see you anymore. But then she, Angela sees you flirting with another coworker named Denise. There's a greater than 50% chance she's going to make a scene. She's going to say, oh, oh, so you dumped me for Denise. Is that what's going on? And then that's just, you don't want this type of drama in the workplace. Yeah, it's just, it's extra unnecessary stress in your life. And actually, I had um, uh, my good friend, Andrew Esquire, he's a lawyer. Uh, mm -hmm. He was on uh, a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about that. I don't remember the exact statistic. It may have been like 80% or something, but don't quote me on it. When there is a relationship in the workplace, within six months, one of those people leaves the company and it usually is the guy. I believe it. I believe it. You know, uh, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's not good. So anyway, that's that's one of my first piece of advice is just don't don't try to bang your coworkers, business colleagues. But yeah, it, my one you, you, to me, as far as between direct verbal game approaches and indirect verbal game approaches, to me, you run more the risk. Matter of fact, while we're on this subject, there's these two, if not three countries that, as we speak, are in the process of trying to pass laws to make basically indirect verbal game a form of date rape. Yeah. Denmark is one. Spain is the most recent. And there's at least one other country that I'm forgetting. And even and, and here in the United States, in uh, New York City, so one of my followers sent me a thing where they, they're trying to pass a law in New York City that if you, say, get a woman in bed by pretending like you're in love with her and pretending like, you know, you want a long-term, emotionally profound relationship with her, only for the woman to find out later that you really just wanted to casually fuck her, that you could be brought up on charges. Yep. That they would look at that as like a form of date rape. Which is so crazy to me. 
Because if we talk about equality, isn't a woman putting on makeup and looking differently the exact same thing? She's mi misrepresenting herself than who she actually is. Mm -hmm. That's not date rape. I didn't get date raped. It's just, it's such nonsense. And the fact that it gets so far and like, I, I'm sure a lot of these countries will actually pass it, which is so crazy to me. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's uh, yeah, because see, one of the simple ways, similar to your example, that women pretty much get over men in the same way is, and one reason why I'm on one, a lot of women will go out to dinner with a guy and give him the misleading impression that he's going to, you know, get some. And they, just, they end up getting a free meal, so they get, you could say, financially date raped. And there's no laws against that. I mean... But at the end of the day, I argue against that. It's up to you as a man to read the social situation and understand what's going on. If you are that stupid to go on a date with somebody and not realize that she's not interested in you, you deserve to lose whatever money it was you paid for dinner. Well, I actually agree. And I did actually a couple of videos about that. And I got some pushback from guys, of course, who favor more indirect. But I said, particularly I said, if your objective is kind of, like one strong stance I have that a lot of guys raises eyebrows and causes some guys to disagree with me. I don't even believe in going out on dates for casual sex. I never go out. Like starting with my 20s, I can honestly, sincerely say the only time I've ever gone on dates with women is when I looked at that woman as long-term girlfriend material. But when I knew for 100% fact that all I wanted from a woman was casual sex, I don't even take women out on dates. I would just either, my main thing was I straightforwardly told what I wanted, and then I would proceed to use my dirty talking skills, either face-to-face, -face, over the phone. i get them to have phone sex, and while we have phone sex, I would make them say, I say, say, Alan, I want you to fuck me. And they would say, oh, Alan, I want you to fuck. I'd say, say it again. That's where the title of my book, Say It Again, because I always say, say it again. I say, say it again. They say, oh, Alan, I want you to fuck me. And then I'd go over to their place, and we fuck. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't take them out on them. But yeah, I, I totally 1,000% agree with what you said, is that some guys think that's part of seduction. I'm like, no, that's whining and dining. Whining and dining is not synonymous with seduction. Because most women, a woman can be totally unattracted to you. But if you offer her a free dinner at a five-star restaurant, ain't too many women going to turn that down. I, I'd go on a date with a gay guy if it meant I get to get a five-star. <laughs> why not? <laughs> and so, there you go. No, absolutely. And that's uh that's something I advocate to all my guys is I always tell them because for me it's always direct to my place. As long as you do so instead of um you know phone sex or something like that, I do it more video chat like this. So I'll get them on FaceTime. We'll talk for like fifteen minutes, fifteen, thirty minutes. I gauge, okay, do they look like their dating profile or whatever? Can I actually get along with this person? Like is there that spark of attraction? And then once you build that rapport, she's more than likely willing to come over. And mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about any of that nonsense of going out to dinner. Yep. Yep. I agree. This is an interesting question here. Um, does mode one apply for high school? For high school? Yeah, I, it, it must be a younger person who's asking. And I think he might be putting the cart for the horse but I, I want your opinion on that like when when is the best time to start developing these skills well i'll say this i'm realistic enough to know that high schoolers particularly nowadays with the internet and everything are making efforts to get better with women i personally at least when it comes to taking on a client I don't take on clients that are under 18. 18 is like my minimum age for a client. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, I've got a number of emails over the last few years. Like one off the top of my head was a guy who's actually from London. And um, he wrote me, and this goes back to the, the talking dirty and phone six thing. This guy wrote me this email basically saying, when he was a freshman and a sophomore, 
he was treated like a nerd and a geek by his classmates. He didn't really have any degree of popularity. Then the summer in between his sophomore year and junior year in high school, he found out about both Mo One and more particularly Usaid again. And he bought the Usaid again audio book. And he said he just started practicing, working on his voice and talking dirty. And long story short, he started, he wrote me this email. He said, Alan, you won't believe at the time he was like a senior in high school. He said, Alan, I have a reputation in my high school in London as the best dirty talker in my entire high school. Now I'm like cool with the, like the jocks, you know, and all the cool guys. They come to me, they're like, hey, man. I hear girls talking about you really good and talking dirty. And he said, Alan, it's all because of your book, Who Said It Again? And I wrote it back. I was happy to get that feedback. But I was like, you're a senior in high school? He's like, yeah. I was like, dude, you, that's young that's for awesome. me. But after that, hey, that'll bode well for you in the future. That is that is awesome. Yeah, because like for me, it, it took until later in high school before I started to learn a lot of this. And it, it really wasn't until I went to college where everything started to click. So it, I don't know. I mean, there's there's certain aspects of it, um, but I don't know. You, Alex? So I'm 27. Oh, you're a baby. <laughs> yeah. I am a baby. Okay. Do I look like a baby? No, you get that big <laughs> hair. You get all that, that beard going on. Yeah. But yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, lot, lots of life experience so far. Um, we can get into that another time. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've, I've seen a lot so far and uh, it's cool. It's it's cool. I love doing this and uh, I love seeing the world as it is. I have to tell you, I never used dating apps until this whole COVID thing and lockdown. And mm -hmm. once I figured it out, it, it really, it's, it's like going on Amazon. Like, what do I want to order this weekend? And you can just boop, 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 boop. You do all the moves right. And then you get your delivery on Friday night. It's absolutely, <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. And I love, I love teaching guys about this, but again, I like to teach, you know, morally just guys. And that's what happens when we do our initial consultation is I kind of read through you and I determine whether we're a match or not, because I'm not going to give some jackass these, these skills because it's just, I, I, I want to bring people together not force them even further apart. I agree with you. I agree with you. Exactly. Yep. Awesome. Um, let me see if there's any other questions here. No, I don't think so. So, okay. Alan, we can go ahead and uh, and wrap up here. I want to respect your time. We were planning to go for about an hour, a little bit over. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to go ahead, um, I can include your website and stuff in the uh, video description. But if you want to go ahead and like plug what you're up to, um, maybe talk about like what you do on Patreon, things like that. Floor is yours. Okay, yeah. Well, number one, again, thank you for having me, Alex. I've enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to chop it up with you. And yeah, all my books can be found on Amazon.com. Um, my main website is actually directapproachdating.com, which I think Alex will probably put in the, his description. And uh, oh, and as far as websites, one more would be my Patreon, patreon.com slash mo1, M-O-D-E-O-N-E. -E. And yeah, I do, with Patreon, I do a mixture of my YouTube videos, and then I do some videos that are exclusive to my patreon.com members, where I just clarify a lot of things from my books or tackle certain scenarios guys throw at me um, related to using mo1. Um... The one thing I've paused because of COVID, I normally offer email consultations, Skype, Zoom, and telephone consultations, and one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face coaching sessions. I haven't done any one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face coaching sessions, though, since uh, the pandemic, but I'll probably resume at some point in the upcoming months, weeks and months. Um, I don't have any speaking engagements that I can think of coming up, although I have uh, guys can go on YouTube and find that I spoke at what's known as the 21 convention. I got yep. an interesting claim to fame, actually. I, I was the first African-American 
speaker the 21 convention ever had. I, I didn't think that would be possible in the 21st century, but I was. That's crazy. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I've, I've watched your speeches from there. It's, you're a great speaker, man. That's Thank why I was so excited you. to have you on as well. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, Alex. Um, but yeah, other than that, oh, well, uh, just on a personal note, yeah, I'm now, you know, a lot of people tripped out when they found out I'm, I'm, I'm now married. I'm married. Uh, to a woman that's almost half my age, because I'm 58, she's 30. Uh, got a son. I'm a father now. Uh, I've got a son that's about 10 months old, and I'm enjoying that new chapter of my life. Um, but I just love working with guys, and, and, and as Alex said, I, I like working with guys who have a good ethical core to them. You know, I, I believe in, it sounds corny, but if you're going, I always say to guys, if you're going to be a womanizer, I believe in being an ethical womanizer. Meaning that I don't, I don't, I don't like the guys who, again, pretend, give women a misleading impression that they're falling in love with them or want to be that woman's next long-term boyfriend or future husband when they're really just trying to have sex with them ten to fifteen times and then going their way. I don't, I don't like that. And, uh, but. Um, yeah. So again, just uh, thank you, and uh, yeah. And continued success to you, Alex. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. All right. I'll go ahead and end it here.